Quizá una de las opiniones más controversiales que tengo, tanto como científico pero también como psicólogo clínico, es que el diagnóstico tradicional basado en manuales como el DCM es completamente inútil y no abona nada, sino que incluso frena áreas, eh, todos los campos de la salud mental, tanto la psicología clínica como la psiquiatría. Sobre esto es este episodio de Insights, ¿sí? Eh, platiqué con el doctor Martin Eins eh, del Brain Clinics Foundation en Holanda, quien es una autoridad mundial en temas de psiquiatría de precisión, principalmente depresión y trastorno por déficit de atención e hiperactividad. Además, es experto en técnicas de neuromodulación, eh, entre las que cabe destacar la estimulación magnética transcranial y el neurofeedback. Así que bueno, te, eh, te invito a ver el episodio con el Dr. Ainz. Estoy seguro que es un episodio del cual todos los profesionales de la salud mental, tanto en el campo de la medicina como en el campo de la psicoterapia, eh, van a tener o van a poder aprender mucho y además estoy seguro que tendrán bastantes opiniones sobre eh, lo que hablamos en el episodio. Así que bueno, sin más, te dejo con el Dr. Arts. Hello guys, welcome to an all new episode of Insights, a space where experts talk to us about several aspects regarding health and well-being. Today, uh, I'm very honored to, to present our guest, uh, Dr. Martin Arns. Uh, Dr. Arns gra graduated in the late uh, 90s as a biological psychologist at Radboud University in Nijmegen, conducted various projects in the field of applied neuroscience in Sydney, Munich and Scotland. Uh, Martin received his PhD at Utrecht University on the topic of EEG-based personalized medicine for HDHD and depression and is specialized in neurobiological aspects of ADHD and depression. Uh, in 2006, Martin founded Brain Clinics Treatment as a Brain Clinics spin-off where new innovative treatments such as uh, magnetic transcranial magnetic stimulation and neurofeedback as well as assessments, for example, uh, sleep assessments and QEEG were pioneered and validated. This clinic was acquired by the NeuroCare Group in 2015, where he still serves as a scientific advisor. In addition, Martin was also founding director of Brainquiry until 2007. Uh, he has been editor of various scientific journals and books and has organized many international conferences and served of on the board of several international professional organizations. Uh, so Martin, uh, thank you very much for, for joining us today and uh, I do hope I didn't mispronounce a lot of a lot of, uh, of things. How are you? I'm pretty good, thanks. Now, it's a, the, the Dutch language I think is a pretty difficult language, especially with all the G's and J's we have in there, so it's almost impossible to pronounce for any non-Dutch people, so yeah, I think you did, you did very well. Oh, great. <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, so, Martin, uh, one of the topics or one of the main objectives of this series is to be able to offer the Latin American or Spanish speaking population some insights regarding uh, current topics on mental health. And, and one of them, uh, a popular topic has been uh, the fairly uh, damaging use of diagnosis as we, as it is currently understood in, in mental health. And for this, uh, the research domain criteria framework has become a, a very popular and plausible alternative. Could you talk to us a little bit about that? Well, I think it's, it's relevant to understand my background because by training I'm a biological psychologist so that already tells you a little bit that I'm not a big fan of the diagnostic statistical manual called the DSM-4 and 5. So yeah, I, I understand where it's coming from. It makes a lot of sense that, that there is a lot of criticism about it. 
But I think if you really go back to what the DSM was developed for, the DSM was never developed to be a prognostic tool. It was developed to facilitate, literally in the DSM, to facilitate the communication among professionals. And uh, due to the lack of usable biomarkers, that's why they actually came up with the model that's, that's described in the DSM. Subsequently, it was of course have by the introduction of pharmacological drugs and treatments and especially insurance companies that the uh, weight that was addressed to the DSM diagnosis basically exploded in, in, in my view a negative sense. And so indeed insurance companies force people to put a code in someone's head before they reimburse something. On the other hand, we know that the prognostic aspect of DSM diagnosis is not very high. If you have a depression, uh, based on behavioral rating scales and on the other hand you prescribe an antidepressant drug or treatment on average your, your likelihood of responding or remitting is about 30 to 40 percent well, I guess that many people that that if you know that were the winning chances in the casino they probably wouldn't go to the casino but it's still what we have to deal with in mental health unfortunately but what it actually is teaching us that even though on the outside we can observe behavior and, and get an impression of someone's behavior we also know that it doesn't map very well onto neurobiology and that's where i think really neurobiological understanding as a background of psychiatric disorders is the way forward and that's indeed where i think had the research domain criteria uh, but also many other initiatives are tapping into we know biomarkers personalized medicine precision uh, psychiatry one of the things that we are more and more interested in is stratified psychiatry, which is like an intermediate step. Uh, but yes, that's definitely where we need to go. We need to understand better what we're looking at. And in my view, I think behavior should come second and not first when we want to look at the neurobiology. Yeah, I totally agree. And even if you were to look at, say, maybe a pure psychologists, even in that case, there are better ways to address behavior I think. But well, talking about psychobiology, which is what we're uh, talking about, what tools could help us in better understanding these uh, biological mechanisms that underlie some uh, problems or some of these mental health issues? I think very diverse. I mean, on the one hand, automatically you would think, well, measures that tap into brain activity. And many people will first, will first think of, well, maybe MRI. Uh, but I think the sobering experience is that even though MRI has been around for, for 20, 30 years, I don't know exactly how long, in my view, the clinical actionability of what the MRI developments, especially fMRI developments have yielded is quite limited. So personally, I mean, I have a little bit of a preference over EEG, as you might uh, have guessed already. Uh, but from what I know, at least from the literature, fMRI is not something that will be around the corner. I think on the other hand, if we look at more techniques that can be more easily applied in clinical practice, especially a EEG or a quantitative EEG, I think that's very promising. But we should also not forget the whole domain of psychophysiology. And psychophysiology incorporates brain activity like EEG, but also EKG and other more peripheral autonomic nervous system markers that can be very relevant. I'll give you one example of that. I think one of the, uh, you. I think the audience might be relatively familiar with brain stimulation techniques. On one hand, we know that there's many pharmacological treatments like antidepressants. But in depression, there's also more and more interest, for example, for a rapid transcranial magnetic stimulation. And where people use very strong magnetic fields to stimulate specific parts of the brain. And we found that that's a very effective treatment for often the severest cases. Uh, but I think that will be widening up and become uh, more widely available to more people. Now, the interesting thing is from the MRI literature, uh, people have done a great deal of good work by delineating and subdividing the whole functional network that's implicated in depression, and which spans from the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, that's a more a superficial structure in the prefrontal cortex, to more deeper structures in the brain, including the subgenuine anterior singlet, and of course, structures like the hippocampus and amygdala uh, will be forming part of that network as well. We actually know that that network is implicated in depression because many treatments that aim at a different level of that network have found to be effective. 
and we can apply transcranial direct current stimulation or TMS in the cortical level. We can apply deep brain stimulation at the deeper level of the subgenuine anterior cingulate. But interestingly, we can also apply vagal nerve stimulation at a small bundle of nerves that is connecting the brain to the heart. And we know that by stimulating that, that, uh, that fiber bundle uh, in very severe patients, we can also get, uh, get effects. Interestingly, you just mentioned psychotherapy and psychologists. Well, we could view that as simply conditioning, but what we also know, in my view, more biologically speaking, I think psychotherapy, in a sense, is more like an endogenous neuromodulation technique. We know that psychotherapy, in a sense, also is activating the subgenuine anterior singlet or the more emotional processing part of the brain. So combining all that information together gives us a lot of wealth of knowledge to optimize treatments. For example, when you apply TMS at this location and you can endogenously activate a deeper structure by psychotherapy, we know that the outcomes will be much stronger. So why don't we combine psychotherapy and TMS at the same time for yes. the same reason that we combine psychotherapy with, um, uh, with, for example, drug therapy. And so that's one lesson we can learn from understanding the network uh, and combining treatments. But now the more important question is, well, some people are advocating where should we stimulate with RTMS? Yes. And in the historical sense, people have been applying what we call the five centimeter rule. And for those of people that are listening and have a more neurosurgical background, they probably will be laughing at this. That is to say, okay, so you establish a location on the, in the brain where your thumb moves and you move five centimeters anterior. Seriously, is that how you guys do brain stimulation in practice? Well, that's how it all started. And that's very fascinating, but it works. Although I think we agree it's very imprecise because people with a large head, a large skull or a small skull, you might be more or less uh, directly targeting it. So then a second development came up, which is, well, let's now start using what we call the BEAM F3 or the BEAM F4 method. That's more inspired by uh, the, the, the relative metric system used in uh, EEG assessments as well, uh, which takes relative head shape into account, which is slightly better, but still uh, it's maybe almost as bad as using behavior as a proxy for brain activity because you're looking on the outside. So some people have proposed that maybe we should use imaging like fMRI to find functional connectivity in networks because we know that we need to activate the deeper areas as well. So if we then look at the MRI scan, what's happening there? And what I think is interesting about this example is that yes, that's an interesting way to follow. Although some advances are made, we know that the reproducibility within subjects reproducibility of MRI scans is not that reliable. And also, why do we send why do we need to send out every individual patient to a doctor if we can do it much simpler? And that's where why I'm giving this example, that's where I think psychophysiology comes in. Because if you recall what I just explained, that there's different nodes of the whole network, and probably the vagal nerve is part of that network as well. So that means that just so hypothetically, if I stimulate the network here, I should be able to pick up activity in the vagal nerve that actually results in heart rate acceleration or deceleration. And that's exactly one of the things that we discovered some time ago. It's a method we call neurocardiac guided TMS, where actually we use the neuroscientific information derived from MRI scans and we simply can stimulate the brain and we have an acute readout of heart rate and we can gauge if we are stimulating the right network or not. And so we don't need to send people out for an MRI scan. And we, can, we simply probe the network and, and immediately observe what's happening. And so just as an example that we should not forget about psychophysiology as well. Yeah, and uh, I mean, on that uh, line, uh, I, I, I want to maybe uh, say two things. The first is that uh, it is often a, a, a discipline that is overlooked uh, both by psychologists and by psychiatrists. We know that not only uh, maybe vagal nerve stimulation does influence, but maybe even in a psychological or, or uh, behavioral way, maybe by your feedback of heart rate variability does have some uh, impact uh, considering these uh, neurocardiac pathways. 
and, and there are uh, interesting results, but I think, uh, well, not many uh, psychophysiologists uh, focus on other peripheral signals. Mm -hmm. And the second thing uh, has to do precisely with the, the issue of trying to individualize the, the location, right? Like when you are trying to find the motor threshold, well, uh, you look until the, <laughs> the finger of the patient twitches a little. Uh, I think a couple of years ago, I was at a, at a conference of neuromodulation and I asked, why don't you look at the threshold looking at the cardiac uh, response but they didn't know how to answer me and so I thought this was not something that they were doing but now <laughs> you tell me that you do so that's that's excellent not only in terms of location but also in terms of selecting a more accurate threshold for that particular area I think well, I think a year ago you were then probably asking the right question, but a question that didn't have an answer yet. Oh, and I mean, to be, to be honest, this is really something very recent. I'm talking about the last weeks, literally. And so indeed, the first application we had for neurocardiac guided TMS was to select between the right location. And we're not going out and do probing every location, but to make a forced choice between the five centimeter or the beam. I think using that as a stratification a technique is a very good way to do it. But indeed, the question is, is the motor threshold that we derive from the thumb twitch identical yeah. to a frontal threshold? And the results that we actually just published today are demonstrating that's not the case. There's no correlation at all between the amount of heart rate deceleration and the percentage of the motor threshold that we're using. There is, however, a good correlation between machine outputs and the cardiac response. And so that tells you that the dissociation that you're suggesting is indeed true. There's no, and we probably have our own individual frontal thresholds that is not automatically related to, uh, to the, the motor threshold. And actually that was something that we were focusing on, but we didn't have an answer. I can't tell you all the details yet, but uh, I think if you stay tuned, we are pretty close of, uh, of uh, yeah, finalizing the study. Uh, and I think we now have a way where we can use TMS prefrontally and indeed establish uh, a cut point where the heart rate deceleration takes place as a methodology to indeed um, individualize the stimulation strength uh, for an individual as well. Uh, but indeed, yep. those are the two methods. Eh? Everything we've done with the thumb twitch, with the whole field of TMS, we can now start redoing using the neurocardiac guided approach as well. And the, the, the heart rate decelerations, actually the thumb twitch of the depression network. Yeah, and, and not only does it make better sense in terms of uh, anatomy and function and, and everything that it uh, does make better sense, uh, but also it is a cost-effective way to to assess the issue, I mean, uh, it's fairly cheap to to record uh, cardiac activity as opposed to an fMRI or an MRI, a structural MRI. Not true, and that was the intent we had. I mean, when we heard of that idea of the subgenual to DLPFC connectivity, of course, the first attempt we did was using the EEG for that, using Loretta, uh, connectivity-based Loretta. And we published a paper on that as well. It was not that successful. We were not that successful in probing that network appropriately to individualize treatment. So more by accident, we stumbled upon the idea of, well, could we use heart rate for that purpose, which ever since I think has been independently replicated in Australia. There's several papers out now, so I think it's, it's a well-established fact right now. Okay. Now, there is, uh, even though we have a magnetic stimulator in the in, in, in our lab, well, not in our lab, but uh, it's for common use of the Institute, our research group has been quite uh, adamant about using, about actually uh, starting some research with that. And the, the fact is that, I don't know if I'm correct, but the rationality for or, or the rationale for some protocol uh, still has uh, some some issues. 
So uh, we know the protocol is maybe stimulating that area and that frequency for a depression, but what is the rationale behind it and how are we, uh, well, as a scientific community, advancing towards uh, being able to choose certain protocol for some people and if it is suitable at all? That, that's something that I'm very interested in. Yeah. Well, I think not using a technique because of the rationale not being correct is something you shouldn't do. Name me one treatment in psychiatry where the rationale that is advocated for is actually correct. I think that the majority of treatments we have in psychiatry have all been accidental discoveries. Mm -hmm. I think the best example or have been the result of a big marketing power and not being correct at all. But I think the biggest example is the introduction of Prozac in the 1980s, 1990s where the sales pitch was, you know, you, you have a patient and they're deficient in serotonin. Their serotonin level is too low. Therefore, we up it with a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor and we fix the problem and your depression goes away. That, that story was what GPs and psychiatrists have been telling patients for many years. Uh, but in the end, we know that serotonin has got nothing to do with the, with the whole depression thing. It's, it's a an, an, an higher order interaction. Uh, effect where in, in the end we see uh, nerve growth factor changes taking place in the hippocampus which got nothing to do with serotonin. So the final common pathway is something completely different uh, as what people have been selling it for. That doesn't mean it doesn't work and so I think it simply uh, exemplifies that we there's too much we don't know about the brain. Sometimes you need these serendipities or these accidental discoveries for something to start going and then um, it evolves. I mean, for the same reason that Barry Sturman, by accident, discovered in cats yeah. the anticonvulsant effects of neurofeedback. I mean, without that accidental discovery, uh, we would have never known neurofeedback as well. But I think to, to that, to, I think to that rationale, indeed, um, had the, the old-fashioned rationale behind TMS was well, had the, with depression, there's this frontal asymmetry either from an anatomical view or from a functional view. Uh, often in EEG, people have been investigating that using frontal alpha asymmetry, uh, where alpha is considered to be the idling rhythm of the brain. It's a bit more complex than that, but also people are supposedly having a little bit more alpha on the left relative to the right. Yes. And therefore, there's a disbalance between left and right frontal cortex. And for that reason, and that was also based on lesion studies that uh, people that had a CVA or a stroke left hemispherically would be more likely to develop um, uh, depressive symptoms. Uh, so based on that theoretical foundation, which we now indeed know is not true at all, uh, the, the protocols in TMS consist of high frequency applied to the left or low frequency applied to the right on, under the assumption that high frequency stimulation increases the excitability uh, and low frequency stimulation is supposedly inhibiting excitability. But we're making many core quantum leaps here all, all right, already, because as we just discussed in the, with the prior topic, we already know that we cannot generalize motor strip TMS findings to prefrontal findings. So the first question is, well, is it true that high and low frequency have the same opposing findings in the prefrontal cortex? Well, honest, honest answer is, I don't know. And then the second question is, well, is actually the foundation of this frontal asymmetry, is it true? Well, we've done several meta-analyses and large studies. I think the largest study we ever published was 1,000 patients with depression and 336 people without a depression. And do you think there was any difference in alpha symmetry? Uh, no. Well, if you do not find anything in that large of a sample, uh, then actually uh, it's probably not there. However, I need to make a very important correction now. The fact that we did not find a difference between people with and without a depression ties back into the first topic we discussed. That only tells us that the DSM is very poor, that neurobiology does not map very well uh, onto behavior or the other way around actually. Because what we did find in that study was when we look at alpha symmetry as a treatment stratification tool, it worked perfectly. It, how, there were some caveats, it didn't predict anything in males. But if we only would looking at females, and this is, sounds a bit funny maybe, but every biomarker that we found to be really predictive, almost always is sex specific. 
predicting. In one time, it's predicting things in males, and the other time in females. And that ties also into the fact that depression is more predominant in females and ADHD is more predominant in males. So that gives you some background there. But what we did find was that actually those people that had a right dominant alpha activity at baseline, they would respond to an SSRI. But if they would have left frontal dominant alpha activity, they would not respond to an SSRI at all. For the SNRI and also for RTMS, we found no such difference. So that triggers the idea like, well, okay, could I indeed measure someone's alpha symmetry, which is a value between minus one for left hemispheric, plus one for right hemispheric. Could I simply take that value? And for patient A, the value is a positive value. So I will prescribe that patient with an SSRI. Now, the next patient walks in and that patient will have an alpha symmetry that has a negative value, is left frontal. Would it be true that because I know he will not respond to an SSRI, that he might respond better to an SNRI or to TMS? This sounds like a thought experiment and the thought experiment statistically made a huge difference, but that's only correlational. So very recently, we actually uh, put this to the test in real life Mm -hmm. uh, in a large psychiatric clinic in the Netherlands where we wanted to do a feasibility trial. And we were only interested to learn if psychiatrists would take a medication uh, advice from an EEG. That was the main question. Secondarily, of course, we wanted to look at the outcomes. So we measured the treatment as usual, what would happen if the psychiatrist would prescribe it. And then we switched it halfway and said, okay, now I'm going to tell you what you're going to prescribe. Well, feasibility was beautiful. They loved it. It was okay. a good story. Uh, they really liked doing it, which I was very surprised in a positive sense. But above all, it was a relatively small study. Maybe because imagine it's two active treatments. We're not comparing to against placebo. Yeah. And actually, with 120 patients, we found a significant improvement in, in, in symptoms after QEG informed antidepressant prescription. And it was almost a doubling of the remission rate. So I think that was a big surprise. And I think it, in a more causal sense, tells us that indeed, uh, e, forget the DSM-405, but look at the neurobiology and we could tease them, uh, split them into relevant subgroups and those subgroups would tell us who would respond to which treatment. Well, I think if you would ask a patient, I think an, a patient would prefer to get a treatment prediction on their forehead rather than a diagnosis because this is useful. This is something that will change their life relative to a, a the DSM diagnosis that will not be helping them uh, way forward uh, to, to that matter. Definitely. I mean, not only does the diagnosis uh, does not lead to better outcomes or to better predictions, at least regarding the outcome, but it also, I mean, for me, it doesn't make sense to think that a, such a heterogeneous uh, presentation of symptoms such as depression and if you have one person that is hype, uh, hyper vigilant and eats a lot and cannot sleep whereas you have a, another participant that uh, does sleep a lot cannot eat and uh, is uh, has psychomotor uh, retardation uh, how can it be the same uh, how can it have the same biological underpinnings? And this is just two examples among the infinite combinations of, of symptoms that they may present. So I think that uh, it is this research is not only uh, of, of great uh, interest, but also of great importance towards better treatment of and understanding of mental health and mental disorders. I think also another thing to consider, uh, because we've done this large trial, we've collected many data sets with RTMS, with medication, with neurofeedback. And you know what's bothering me the most is that even though we might like or dislike the DSM-4 or 5, even if we do prediction research, we're still stuck to it. Because how do we define that someone is a responder or a non-responder? Or how do we define remission and non-remission? That is still based on the symptom count that we get from the DSM. 
So just to give you one example, so in this very large study in a thousand patients that we conducted, there's two different rating scales we used. The Hamilton depression ventry uh, that's administered by the clinician, but also the quits. That's a questionnaire that the patients will fill out themselves. Now we take many patients and we then assign them remission or non-remission. And we do it using uh, instrument A and instrument B. They're both very valid. What do you think would be the agreement between those two, uh, those two uh, toolboxes? Poor. But what's poor? I mean, is 70 to 80% agreement poor or even lower? No, I think even lower, I, I would think. Oh, well, it was actually 30%. 30, yeah. So, so if you do research, you want to be able to rely on what we call ground truth scenarios because we're developing a prediction model. And if I need to predict where an atom will be flying in an hour from now, well, that, that can be ground truth based on the circumstances we're dealing with. But we in psychiatry are shooting at a moving target. And it depends on what, what questionnaire you use. So what we've learned from that, I mean, we have done that for quite some time because that's what scientists will request. Well, how do you define response, non-response? And we do not as yet have a thermometer or any biomarker that tells us how severely depressed you are. Nor do I think we will ever discover that because that's all tied to the DSM-4 and 5. So one thing that we did learn is that we need to talk the right language. We should forget about the, the behavioral descriptions in the psychological terms. We put them on the side. But if we are developing a biological biomarker, it needs to be informed from biology as well. And so one of the recent works, uh, which really convinced me that that's the right approach to follow, is that we used a very sophisticated approach to EEG. So uh, we had a very large data set of more than a thousand patients. And we used the so-called functional independent component analysis from Loretta. That means you can, in a data-driven, data reductionistic way, uh, statistically tease out the different components that explain your EEG. And you need large samples for that, obviously. And so that yielded about 58 different components. Well, if you start looking at all those 58 components, that's probably, yeah, after correcting for all kinds of multiple testing, nothing is gonna be left uh, after that. So what we actually did, we looked at genetic data. And I don't think genetic data are very diagnostic yet, but there is so-called gen uh, genome-wide uh, association studies where they've developed so-called polygenic risk scores. Mm -hmm. And so they have required probably a hundred thousand people with and without a depression to derive at that small set of genes that for sure will show a uh, Bonferroni corrected risk for depression. And it's not going to explain the whole story of depression, but we've actually used that polygenic risk score to select the networks out of those 58 that are somehow associated with it. And so we've been using the, the polygenic risk score as a fish hook to pull the whole network from the EEG data. And actually we found that indeed there were two, two, one or two networks that were significantly associated. Then if we port those EEG networks, so we only use the genetics to identify them, and we port them to very large prediction sets, it predicted uh, treatment response very well. So there we used the behavior secondarily and not primarily. And I think that's really the way forward uh, where we need to rely on ground truth scenarios that are more stable. As a different example, in another study, we are using, for example, uh, maturation. For we know that alpha frequency, for example, is maturing with age. The older you get, the, the, the more it will speed up. And so that's a biological process we can, we can map and we can optimize and develop our marker against maturation. And when we then in a second step validated that biomarker against methylphenidate neurofeedback and atomoxetine response, we saw it was very predictive in, in, in very interesting ways as well. And so I think this notion that we need to keep on the right level of communication, if we use biology or neurobiology, then stick within the realm of neurobiology in order to optimize the likelihood of finding relevant biomarkers. I think that's really at least one of the things I learned the last year, which I think is quite fascinating. Yes. And, and so this impacts, I mean, uh, taking 
this domains into consideration, sorry, impacts on the better selection of a particular treatment. Uh, may may it be pharmacological or maybe a neuromodulation uh, or external neuromodulation, but uh, also within a same treatment, uh, I, I would like to talk about the particular case of, of neurofeedback. It can also help us determine what is the best protocol in order to individualize it to the patient. You have a uh, not so recent but fairly recent article uh, using individualized treatments in ADHD and it yielded uh, far better effect sizes than the typical protocols of, uh, I don't know, theta beta uh, ratio. I think before we go there, I need to make a small explanation of of terminology. Okay. Because I think I think it pertains to this topic. I mean, to, historically, when people talk about precision psychiatry, precision medicine, or personalized medicine, mm -hmm. theoretically, that means that you aim to individualize the treatment. And to the example of cancer research, you take a little bit of cancer tissue based on the genetic decomposition of that cancer tissue tissue, you can then pick a specific treatment that might not be approved or indicated for the treatment of cancer, but that is individualized to the tissue you have, to the specific mutation that you are carrying. And that is the ultimate example of how we would like to foresee personalized medicine. That was also my starting point about 20 years ago. However, when I further developed uh, and saw more data coming by, I realized that's impossible. Because hypothetically, this could mean that we take an EEG and this person that according to DSM has a depression diagnosis walks out with Ritalin because the, my personalized approach uh, advises that Ritalin is, is the right choice of treatment. Well, these are all N equals one experiments, which is impossible to get approval on. Also, what I learned actually is that uh, when you look at many treatments is that there's often uh, within a class of, of treatments like antidepressants or treatments for ADHD or even within your feedback, there's already quite a wide menu we can pick from. Uh, with antidepressant treatments, we've already heard deep brain stimulation, TMS, uh, several medications. So there's a handful of menu items to pick from. Yeah. And that is a different approach. So when you use a biomarker to trigger a life or death decision, that means you tell uh, your likelihood of response will be 80% or 20%. That is very tricky because you cannot ethically withhold someone a treatment based on a biomarker. Even if the biomarker is 80% accurate and tells you that 20% is the likelihood of, still, of you still responding, you cannot take that 20% likelihood away from someone that might be very suicidal, very sick or whatever. And that's personalized precision medicine. So therefore, what we are focusing on is, well, if we know for sure that something isn't, isn't gonna work for someone or with relative certainty, why don't we immediately look at the alternative? So what other thing could work for that patient? What could work better for them? And so we are not making a biomarker driven choice on one, but we are stratifying and we're using the biomarker to stratify between evidence-based treatments. And that's what we call stratified psychiatry. And I know this is a nuance of a difference for many people probably listening and watching, but the practical implications are completely different. And that's where we, we get into the topic of neurofeedback because we know that theta beta neurofeedback is very well investigated and well, we can have a whole discussion, but at least in my view, we can consider that an evidence-based neurofeedback protocol. We can have slow cortical potential neurofeedback that might even have stronger evidence to go with it. And then we have SMR or sensory motor rhythm neurofeedback uh, that also has decent support for the treatment of ADHD. And so you can consider this in an analogy to be the tricyclic antidepressant, the SNRI and the SSRI for depression. And so three different protocols that by themselves on a one size fits all level have shown to be uh, effective in the treatment of ADHD. So actually what we have done with our QEG informed approach, and I would like to stress the informed because in the field of neurofeedback, there is many QEG based studies, which is more alike the true individualization, but often lacking much of the scientific 
evidence behind it. Many people do what I consider to be chasing the red dot. You get a QEG report and you only focus on the most deviating score, which most often is an artifact driven by whatever. And so the only thing that we actually did is we are using the EEG to, 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 to run by our checklist. The first check we do, okay, does someone have frontal excess of theta? No. Okay, theta beta ratio is out of the window. If there's no theta to begin with, why do we want to train it? Then the second one is, okay, we can then still pick between SMR and SCP neurofeedback. That could be uh, informed, for example, uh, by if people have indeed uh, sleep, uh, sleep problems of trouble falling asleep, then we are more likely to choose for SMR neurofeedback. And also we inspect the SMR band if there's and like a new rhythm adjacent, then we would prefer to go for slow cortical potential neurofeedback. So we are actually in a very simplistic fashion only optimizing neurofeedback based on a signal to noise ratio perspective. If there's yeah. no signal to train, we prefer not to train it. There's a couple of refinements there. We might add in the mix beta spindle down training, but in the core essence, we are stratifying people to one of the evidence-based protocols. And indeed, the remission rates we are seeing are, I think if I recall correctly, 57%. And I'm not sure which study you refer to. We published it in 2012. And we actually last year published a, a multi-centric replication that identically okay. replicated the outcomes across multiple clinics as well. And a 57% remission, I'm not talking response, is, is in my view higher than what you would uh, would find normally uh, with uh, methylphenidate treatment. Yeah, so just to maybe summarize a little what you just said, which is uh, I think of other importance to uh, to clarify, is, uh, it's not the same just to go and normalize whatever activity I, I found abnormal, which would be a QEG-based uh, neurofeedback. But this, uh, maybe you uh, beforehand know what abnormalities you could expect, and then uh, if one of the evidence-based treatments is congruent with this, then you go ahead and apply it. If there is uh, a, a rationale behind it and the abnormality uh, with regard or regarding the symptoms, uh, this would be a QEEG informed uh, neurofeedback. And this would uh, be in line with this stra stratified psychiatry framework. Uh, am I correct? Exactly. I mean, it's identical to what we previously discussed about depression. Now, there we use alpha symmetry to say, okay, if, I'm not going to say we go ECT or we go vitamin D supplementation or we go off-label prescription. I'm just saying we have a range of treatments. Why don't we simply increase your likelihood of responding by using frontal alpha symmetry to assign right or left? And in the same fashion, we do this with your feedback. And also the NCG TMS we discussed is, is actually the same approach. And five centimeter rule and beam are known to work. Those are the SSRIs and SNRI of brain stimulation, if you like. And we simply choose between those two. And the beauty is here, as long as the principle do no harm is met. And if you want, I can show you data that across all these treatments, the response remission rates are indistinguishable on the group average level, and but this is teaching us that we are now finally able to dissect the relevant subgroups within a disorder to be preferentially responding here or responding there. And I think that's that's not precision psychiatry or personalized medicine yet, but this is something we can already do in clinical practice tomorrow. And because we know that there's many patients in need for better treatment, and that's one of the missions we have at the Brain Clinics Foundation as well, make applied neuroscience accessible to patients, not in a year, but tomorrow. And that's the, the focus of the research we have. Yeah, and, and I think it's a, a greater, a great uh, effort towards this new framework, which hopefully will uh, well, we'll have a more and more, not only evidence, but also uh, adepts. Just, uh, I don't want to take a lot of, uh, a lot more of your time. So I would just like to, to ask, 
what is what does the future hold for this new uh, approximation to mental health and mental disorders well i think and i hope a promising future i think um i think if we can um, get more agreement or more understanding as well because most of the scientists out there that uh, they have a laser sharp focus which is good for many scientists but often by the laser sharp focus they forget about well how do i get it to a patient and that's why i'm stressing the example of and you might have a lot of sophisticated uh, analyses, AI, machine learning, whatever, and you find that you can really predict one thing. But predicting maybe very accurately that someone will or will not respond might not be that practically feasible. And so once we get this stratification concept more broadly uh, adopted and more broadly people's minds focused on that, I think that could really accelerate the adoption of neurobiology to inform what we can do in, in psychiatry. And we should forget about discussions that some have people on in the periphery, something like, well, is a psychiatric disorder something biological or not? That's got nothing to do with it. This is about optimizing the, op the, the right care for the right patient. Uh, and I think if we can really put the hands together with many people, I think it's promising. The second thing is I think we need way more open science. We need, need to share our data. And with some of the studies, and I cannot talk all the details yet, so you'll see it very soon, uh, but all the studies that we're currently doing right now, none of the large data sets that we currently have was single-handedly able to make a difference. It requires a lot of collaboration with other colleagues, other data sets, other labs to put the pieces of the puzzle together and thereby really prove and replicate that something is true. We in no way need more data that shows another marker here, another marker there. We need well-validated and well-replicated markers. And that's also maybe interesting for your audience. We will be publishing that the, when we just celebrated the 20th uh, anniversary last weekend. Uh, and we are currently in the process of publishing all the EEGs uh, that we collected and are allowed to share over the last 20 years, which is uh, almost 1300 uh, EEGs standardized with phenotypical data, with treatment response data, with diagnostic data, anything you like for free downloads from our website for researchers. Uh, and that will be published soon, hopefully. Uh, and also that is intended to, uh, to benefit the replication crisis that we're in. And so people that now claim that they have a perfect diagnostic or prognostic application of EEG have a test drive in our data and demonstrate it. If you can replicate it in our data, shoot me an email. And uh, yeah, I think it's really uh, the way forward. Great. Uh, well, I don't know about the audience, but I'm definitely uh, interested. I'm very excited to to look into this this research and this uh, databases that you talk about and the near future. So, uh, and it's uh, it has also great didactic value for training new students and well, great. So, uh, Martin, uh, I want to thank you again for for having taken time out of your schedule to to meet with us and for talking uh, about these topics. I definitely gained new insights on 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 this emergent field and hopefully we will be hearing a lot more from this from a lot of research groups around the the world all right thanks you can be thanks sure that you will be hearing from our research group with dr italia fernandez <laughs> all right before well, thank you thank you again and have a great day martin thank you. bueno pues te agradezco mucho si llegaste hasta aquí Espero que hayas disfrutado mucho de este capítulo y hayas aprendido mucho del Dr. Arens. Eh, yo sin duda te comento que disfruté muchísimo grabándolo y que es uno de mis favoritos de toda la serie. Bien, eh, pues sin más te invito a checar en la descripción. Eh, ahí tienes algunos links para ponerte en contacto con el Dr. Arens y revisar su trabajo. Además de los links a mis redes sociales donde podemos estar en contacto. Te invito a suscribirte al canal eh, para que estés pendiente de todos los desarrollos de Neurosapiens, ¿sí? Eh, y si le das a la campanita, pues ya te avisará cada que tengamos un nuevo video. Bien, 
Nos vemos el jueves en un nuevo episodio de Insights. Hasta luego.